ladies, I understand that this slot is traditionally the light-hearted part of the evening, but I'm a conservative member of the House of Lords. <laughs> and as you can imagine, I'm not in a very light-hearted mood. <laughs> and at the moment, most of you are probably thinking that it's rather ironic to be listening to someone from the Conservative Party talking about power. <laughs> After all, they've spent the last six weeks um, almost losing their grip on it. But we've learned an important lesson. Campaigns do matter. Now, I chair a campaign to get more Conservative women elected to Parliament, women to win. Seven years ago, we had just 17 Conservative women MPs. And as we went into the general election, we had reached 70. Quite an achievement. <laughs> well, ladies, I was invited to make these few remarks at about the time that the general election started. I assumed that I would be standing here today with a great story to tell about the increase in numbers of Conservative women MPs, which at that time was estimated by the Fawcett Society and other pollsters to be an additional 30. Hubristically, no doubt, I said it would be an honour. Well, today, sadly, we have 67 Conservative women MPs, and I'm glad that there's one in the room at least. Uh, still 21% of the parliamentary party, but nonetheless an extremely disappointing result. And the 30 women, brilliant women, on the brink of becoming MPs who have worked their socks off for the past six weeks have had to rethink their lives. On Friday morning, I wanted to hide under my duvet. Actually, I wanted to pull out of making this speech. <laughs> but the first text I received from one of these great women was, Anne, we need your leadership. Well, leadership was the last thing I felt capable of giving at that moment, but I crawled out from under that duvet and started thinking about what to do next. Now, there is a silver lining to this rather dark cloud. Parliament is more diverse than ever before, and it has over 30% of women MPs, the highest level ever. But my disappointment is this is because of the Labour Party, and my own party has not been part of this leap forward. Now, I tell this rather niche story, this parable really, because each and every one of you here today, the world's most powerful women, now at the top of your trees, will have experienced unexpected setbacks and disasters which have made you stronger. Kipling's great quote, if you can meet triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, we'll no doubt triumph with you all. So tempting as it is to hide under that duvet, I have to find my new power in order to support those women to develop theirs. You will all know that, oh, thank you. <laughs> Nearly at the end. Um, so you will all know the quote about the special place reserved in hell for the women who don't help other women. <laughs> well, Madeleine my, Albright. <laughs> it is Madeleine Albright. Well, my new power is to ensure that I don't end up there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Baroness Jenkins. And I think we can all relate, uh, maybe not quite on that level, but to wanting to hide under the duvet and also humor. I think more politicians could use that in trying times. Um, we also wanted to hear from Minister of Employment and Integration for Sweden, Ilva Johansson. Ilva? Hello, everybody. I would like to share a moment with you that was, happened 23 years ago. Uh, I was 30. I had just given birth to twins. Very early. They came very early. Uh, they were four months old and the phone rang. And it was the prime minister. And he asked me if I would like to join to be a cabinet minister. And that was really a difficult uh, question to answer because I had these two wonderful twins. And the prime minister said, I'm going to form the first ever cabinet in the world with 50% female cabinet ministers. And we're going to show everybody it's possible to combine with being a parent. But being a twin parent, <laughs> that's a little bit more difficult. But I said yes. So I became an uh, education minister with twins four months old. 
And in Sweden, the first day of appointment, uh, you have to go to the king. So I was sitting at the king's table with all the ministers, and I was breastfeeding. And I hadn't been breastfeeding off for a while. And you know what happens? It starts coming out. Yeah. With the king. So that was a little bit uh, embarrassing. But this, this is the point. I decided uh, I'm now a cabinet minister. I have a lot of power. I have much more power than almost any other woman in Sweden with the problem of combining family and work. So I have to use this power to, pave a, to make way for other women to come after. And I actually did that. So the first thing I phoned to the uh, hospital, give me this pump so I can use for my breastfeeding, uh, so that won't happen again. <laughs> but also a lot, a lot of, a lot of other uh, initiatives saying, when, you know, when they, they call us, you have in, in a dinner with the minister, I said, no. You can come at 11 o'clock and we can have a coffee and then you go home. So we don't have a meeting at the evening. We don't travel so much, but we have to travel sometimes. Sweden became minister of the European Union at that time. So I have to go to Brussels with the twins, but we managed that too. So the thing is, if you have the power, you are obliged to use the power to make pay for other women to come after. Because otherwise, we end up where you said. Thank you.